मेरा आवाज आ रहा है हाँ आ रहा है ओके
हाई सर हेलो सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर एक्चुअली यू आर म्यूटेड आई गेस्ट बिगिनिंग ऑफ दिस Uh, mm-hmm. Then again, uh, since cases were increasing, so again they uh, stop uh, calling us back. So yeah, okay. few few are uh, there at the campus. So well, when is the plan to go back? I mean, it probably we'll see how the situation unfolds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, in the uh, next uh, semester around June, June, July, maybe they'll uh, call us back. I see. Yeah. So how 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 is uh, like people who have to go to the labs? How is that being done? Uh yeah, uh, in inside campus uh, currently uh, they have uh, like asked us uh, stay at your hostels only. Uh, only a uh, few uh, departments are allowing uh, for students, PhD scholars to go to the lab. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it's been more than a year like this now, right? Yeah, one and a half year almost. I see. So you're doing PhD or masters? Yeah, in- yeah, PhD. Uh, I'm from uh, electronics and uh, communica- uh, electrical communication department, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, research scholar. Cool. So what are you working yeah. on? Uh, it's like broadly on uh, radar signal processing. So uh, yeah, for, for different applications. And who who are you working with there? Uh, Professor Amitabh Bhattacharya. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yes. Sir. Uh, actually, sir, I would like to mention that uh, most of us, like uh, I probably uh, volunteers also, and most of the faculties also, uh, they couldn't able to join uh, the session uh, because of various reasons, so health related issues and other. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, most of us, uh, like, uh, very few people will be like there. So, if you excuse us for that. No, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So it's five thirty almost. So we'll start. So, uh, welcome all attendees. Uh. Thank you for joining today's session. So, uh, I'll introduce myself. I am uh, Prajakta Sathe, a uh, research scholar uh, from uh, EC Department of Kharagpur, uh, and also currently volunteering as a chair of uh, IEEE APMDT Student Land Chapter, Kharagpur. So, I welcome our today's uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Koshik Sen Gupta. Uh, he is currently a faculty of Department of Electrical Engineering. Uh, at the Princeton University, USA. So, I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Sen Gupta, so for accept accepting our invitation to give today's talk. So yeah. So okay. So since uh, our, uh, okay. So I'll I'll in, um I'll give the intro- introduction uh, uh, for uh, today's speaker. so so uh, koshik sen gupta um, uh, so he received a btech and mtech degree uh, in electronics and electrical communication engineering from iit kharagpur india so he is our alumni of iit kharagpur and also from our department so and then he uh, did his ms and uh, phd degree uh, in electrical engineering from uh, california institute of technology Uh, uh usa in 2008 and 2012 respectively after that in 2013 he joined department of electrical engineering princeton university uh, as a faculty member uh, and then uh, uh, he received a bell labs prize in uh, 2017 then young uh, investigator program uh, 
award uh, from the office of naval research in 2017 the dharpa uh, young faculty award in 18 2018 and uh, e lorenz keys uh, junior immersion electric cooperation uh, junior faculty award also uh, he was six times selected at the princeton engineering uh, commendation list for the outstanding teaching in 2014 16 uh, to 2020 so he received excellence in the teaching award uh, from school of engineering at princeton university in 18 also he served uh, as a committee member of ims 2021 as a workshop co chair and as a member of mtt committee uh, on terahertz and technology oh, and list goes on there are uh, various other achievements so and his current uh, research interest are uh, high frequency ics electromagnetics and optics for various applications in sensing imaging and high speed communication so i would like to welcome uh, dr kaushik sen gupta so uh, thank you sir so uh, I'll hand over to you now. Okay, thank you, Prajakta, uh, for the introduction, for the very kind introduction um, and invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I think the last talk I can see Professor Bhattacharya here as well. How are you? Yes. <laughs> uh, I think the last time I was uh, in the campus was ten years ago, um, 2011, I think, uh, 12. So it, it's really a pleasure. It is a little early in the morning. Uh, it's eight here, uh, and uh, even in Kharagpur, I used to miss the 7:30 class. So. Um, I'm trying to do my best to uh, stay awake with with some coffee. Um, with that, let me uh, let me present um, my screen here, and let me know if you could see it. Uh, can you see it? Uh, yes, sir. It's yeah, it's visible. All right, hold on. What's it? You see the full screen? Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, again, it's a pleasure to be here. I so what I want to do today is sort of uh, you know be, not be very heavy on the talk um, and um, in focus on you know frequencies above a uh, hundred gigahertz. Um, what are the new opportunities there? Um, what are the new applications that are exciting? And how to build chip scale systems at these frequencies? Why do we think that's the next wireless frontier? Okay. Before I begin, because it's a you know MTT DMO talk, I have to uh, you know put some uh, publication slides, uh, publicity slides for MTT. So please become an IEEE MTTS member today, and particularly because of uh, the following reason. Uh, I'm serving as a workshop co-chair um, in IMS this year, and it is virtual. Um, the workshops are all virtual, which essentially means that you can attend the entire IMS workshop for the first time ever. Even last year, it didn't happen uh, from the comfort of your home. And uh, please do try um, to attend the workshops. I, you know, the workshops are really a very good place where you learn the tricks of the trade. From the experts in the field, and the other thing is, if you register for one workshop, you register for all workshops, which means you get all of the materials and the videos. And these workshops will be live, so you can attend them live as well. So, if you haven't done it already, please register for IMS and um, for the workshops for sure. Okay. So again, you know, you already know the benefits of MDT. It's one of the largest. IEEE organizations. It is why we are all here, and so you know, just make sure that you participate in this large community of people who are working towards you know next generation of wireless systems, whether for sensing, whether for communication. So with that, I will just um, uh, begin my talk, um, saying that you know we are, if you have not realized it, we are in the fourth communication age, uh, and and what are the other three communication ages? And the idea there was like you know wireless is not new. It's been there for 100 years. So the first wireless communication was essentially looking at, you know, uh, station to station communication. This is the kind of you know wireless systems that existed in the days of the Titanic. 
um, the reason that you know there were survivors in the Titanic was because the ship could send a wireless signal, SOS signal to the nearby ship. So it was like ship to ship, radio station to radio station communication. The next generation of communication happened in the 1930s and the 40s, which was station to radios, right? So where people could listen to radios at the, ho at the home. So it's station to people communication. The last decade, a couple of decades was people to people. You can call up anybody right now. Um, on your cell phone. So that would be a uh, people to people communication. And of course, the next decade is basically becoming everything to everything communication. So once everything communicates to everything, you are increasing the number of nodes in the system from population of Earth, which is billions, to population of things that would like to communicate that is pro potential in the range of trillions. So in, in that sense, we are really in the new age of communication. It's very exciting. It will be the new economic opportunities and engine of the future. So in terms of that to be the case, what's so fundamentally also different is that the spectrum that's getting available for frequencies above um, you know, 20, 20 gigahertz and beyond were becoming available for the first time. Um, you may have known that you know, the millimeter wave frequencies were typically reserved for satellite communication, uh, for defense, but now now, frequencies above 28 gigahertz are being commercially available. Uh, I mean, I have an iPhone 12 right now uh, that has a you know four 28 gigahertz phased arrays directly integrated into the phone. So not just 28, 28 and 39. Um, so you can already see that commercial applications are taking place um, at these higher frequencies, and more and more commercial applications would happen at these higher frequencies. And one of the particular reasons why you want to go to higher frequencies uh, is, of course, higher data rates, but also because spectrum at the lower frequencies is very expensive. Uh, spectrum is the costliest real estate on Earth. Uh, so just to give an example, if you have not followed the recent auctions, whether it's India or whether it's US, um, spectrum in the sub six gigahertz is very expensive. So I think in uh, January, uh, there was some auction uh, that happened in US. Um, and the spectrum in the C band, which is 2.7 to 3.2 gigahertz, was sold at $160 million. This is almost like 1,000 crores per megahertz. Um, and so you can imagine that the kind of you know, money that you, uh, the companies have to put in to get spectrum in this lower frequency is licensed spectrum is enormous. On the other hand, because millimeter wave spectrum is relatively unused, the spectrum per the cost per megahertz is much lower, which essentially means there's a lot of you know, uh, movement towards the frequency. Of course, it has its own challenges. So in terms of you know, in, in going from you know, 10 gigahertz and beyond how this how the new application space would emerge, you know, I'll just highlight a couple of points here. One is obviously communication, right? Smart cities, wireless backhauls, uh, easy point to point networks, very high speed data rates. So that's one. And those kind of data rates you need for, um, you know, augmented and virtual reality, AR, VR, things of that nature. Um, AR, VR is really being, you know, um, adopted by many, many different professions from health to, you know, teaching to defense. Um, and for all of these connections, you need low latency, high, ba high bandwidth, right? The kind of things that millimeter waves can offer. The other applications from communication is sensing. Higher frequencies would give you higher resolution, simple diffraction limit. So, you know, radars in your car right now um, operate at 77 gigahertz. Uh, even when I was doing my PhD, like 13, 14 years back, um, well, a little less than that, um, you know, 10, 11 years back, um, you know, car radars used to be expensive. You know, uh, sometimes car radars used to cost more than the car. And, and so, but nowadays you can buy these radars operating at 77 gigahertz with silicon chips, $100 you know, 5,000, 7,000 rupees. Um, and so in, in, in terms of capability, now you can put multiple radars uh, on cars. And so the vision of autonomous cars, self-driving cars, uh, you know, fundamentally relies on these kind of high performance sensors. Uh, this is also true for UAVs and drones and things of that nature that you can see on the right hand side, but also for applications that you may not have thought about. So this is a newer uh, work from Google Solly that uses a 60 gigahertz radar Infineon chip um, to pick up tiny signatures from your hand 
Why do you need a 60 gigahertz radar? Because your movement of the finger is very tiny, is on the millimeter range. So you need a millimeter wave to be able to have enough bandwidth to give you the depth resolution and the cross strength resolution. Correct? And so you can imagine the kind of application that will open up as a result of wireless gesture recognition and things of that nature. The other application is also spectroscopy and also security imaging. The last picture that you see on the right hand side is a picture from uh, JPL NASA um, they're using a 675 gigahertz uh, image sensor. I've actually seen that system. It's pretty large. Uh, and they can scan it at um, 20, 25 feet away. Uh, to create the kind of image that you see where a person is hiding a gun and you are able to detect from a long distance. Just a couple of points on communication itself. You know, there are why, why, what are the interesting applications here? You know, obviously UAV communication is interesting. Uh, this was a recent DARPA work, well, a few years ago, that demonstrated 100 gigabit per second over 200 kilometers uh, between two flights. Um, this was not really using 100 gigahertz, but close to 100 gigahertz carrier frequencies. Wireless backhaul is very interesting. So, you know, one data point that you can think about is that um, the number of people who are connected to the internet um, and compared to the number of people who have a cell phone is very different. Uh, number of people who have cell phone or number of cell phones on the earth right now exceeds the earth's population. So it's like almost 8 billion subscribers. However, not all of them have cell phones or uh, have internet connectivity. More or less 50% of the Earth is still outside internet connectivity. Uh, and the reason is that majority of the people uh, who are outside internet connectivity are within 10 mile radius of uh, base, some base station. So essentially what it, what it needs to be done, that base station needs to be connected to another base station close by. Typically that's done by optical fiber, uh, but optical fiber is often very expensive to lay out. And so the idea is, can we do wireless backhaul? So what would wireless backhaul do? You do not need to lay, you know, dig the ground, lay the optical fiber and all of these things. What you can do is, you know, put two towers with, uh, you know, point to point high data rate links and easily make up, um, you know, connectivity uh, to reach to people who are outside the web. Uh, Facebook is doing a lot of work on this. You might have heard of with, you know, not just uh, balloons and things of that nature, but also with, um, you know, wireless backhaul. Um, and so, one of the fundamental things that you need for all operation at these frequencies is the idea of antenna arrays. It is very different the kind of frequencies from uh, below six gigahertz. Why? Because if you look, if you know the path loss uh, for the same uh, antenna gain, the path loss increases as frequency squared. So if you go from three to thirty gigahertz, you're already you know increases by a factor of hundred which essentially means that you need multiple antennas to focus the beam to direct to the you know, person of interest or to the receiver of interest. Now, typically, there's not one single receiver. There's multiple receivers, which essentially means you need multi-beam, right? So the idea of antenna beam forming, phased arrays, MIMO arrays are fundamental towards operation at this frequency. Directivity, uh, that's a missile defense uh, system. Um, you know, you can see the phased arrays that goes on a fighter jet here, and then F-18 is an expand array, uh, you know, that scans uh, in space. And, and the fundamental idea of all of these arrays are uh, the way they're built. How are they built? Well, most of these are based on gallium arsenide uh, TR module. So what is that? It's basically a gallium arsenide module where you have amplifiers, phase shifters, mixers, things of that nature that you buy as individual chips. These chips are connected with printed circuit boards, um, you know, carefully laid out, you know, manually done um, in terms of layout. Uh, and then you have a TR switch, power amplifiers, LNAs. Finally, once you have one module, in order to build an array, you, you know, repeat that module when you build these large systems. As a result of that approach, which is you know, non-integrated, think about the number of chips that goes into one module, and therefore think about the number of chips that goes into a uh, you know, thousand element module. It's a very expensive process. Um, and But that's been the way it has been done for so long. In the last 15 years, there's been a shift. The idea has been that maybe we need a gallium arsenide module up front in the PNLNA, but the entire backend, including you know, radio frequency processing, could be done in silicon. And why silicon? Because of Moore's law, because the integration, it 
uh, offers. So we, sometimes we don't even think about you know, how far we have come down in that road. Um, it, it's really one of the remarkable inventions of um, the last decade in, you know, in, 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 com in the same league as penicillin and, and so on and so forth. It's really changed our world, right? So if you think about you know, 1960, which is you know, 60 years ago, uh, the first uh, planar IC came out, uh, which is one flip-flop bit, the whole wafer, one bit. Okay. It was a remarkable invention at the time. From one bit, we have gone to, um, you know, nowadays NVIDIA Tesla graphics processors with 20 billion transistors. Think about that. I mean, that's three times Earth's population in a single chip. Uh, all of these transistors more or less works, which essentially means that the cost per transistor is nothing at this point, right? So just to give you a sense of it, uh, 100 million transistors can now be packed into one millimeter square for a volume production of a dollar. Um, and so think about it, 100 million transistors is one millimeter. Actually, now it's even higher. Uh, the latest iPhones is like 130 million transistors in one millimeter square, but just for a dollar. So the question is, this is what silicon has changed in computational world. How has this affected radio frequency work? So in radio frequencies, you know, this is the kind of work that, you know, stations that you had like 100 years ago during the time Titanic. Um, and these are large megawatt transmitters. Why did you need more megawatt transmitters? Well, because your receivers were pretty bad. Uh, and so you need to transmit a lot of power for you to pick up everything at the receiver. Um, look at a person. I mean, the person would die if something you know, really goes wrong here. What do the next generation millimeter wave, you know, sort of base station looks like? Phased arrays. So, you know, these are a couple of examples from IBM. So you can see the person holding a 28 gigahertz phase array. This is a, uh, from Nokia, 100 gigahertz phase arrays. And so you can have these, you know, uh, sort of chip scale phase arrays and build large scale phase arrays based on that. Uh, this progress was not sudden. It has, ha you know, it's taken its time. Um, so if you think about where were the first silicon millimeter wave phase arrays came about, um, you know, that was back in the mid 2000s uh, from Caltech. Um, they demonstrated the first uh, 24 gigahertz phase array uh, for radars and then 77 gigahertz phase array. At the same time, uh, Berkeley uh, was doing their work on 60 gigahertz phase arrays. This is, you know, this is where when I was uh, almost like finishing up my bachelor's <laughs> in, in Kharagpur. Um, and, and then the company came out, Silicon Psi Beam, um, in 2000, around 2006, uh, demonstrating, you know, silicon phase arrays at 60 gigahertz for, at the time, for wireless HD. Uh, so your monitor could be wirelessly connected to your um, projector and, and things of that nature, you know, uh, sustaining gigabit per second wireless links. The company didn't really take off at the time because the market was ready, but now all of these technologies are, um, you know, are really, you know, prized possessions. And it's sometimes in, 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 in startup world, you know, it's not really the technology, it's, it's whether the ancillary technologies are ready. Uh, and so the network had to be ready to be able to use many of these kind of innovations that happened back in the day. Uh, the last work was actually, you know, part of my PhD work where we demonstrated the first terahertz space array uh, at 300 gigahertz, that was back in 2012. And so, you know, there's been a long work that has happened to enable these silicon phase arrays. The other exciting application is space. Um, you know, you have, there's a lot of work going on across the world, including India, on you know launching satellites and in the Leo especially. And so there's a lot of interesting applications happening in the space. And space connectivity is also phase arrays. Um, so this is, if you haven't seen this, this is a Starlink um, phase array module. And there's a interesting videos on on taking it apart and seeing what is inside. You see what is inside, it's built with silicon chips, um, tile silicon chips, um, many of them that are connected to, uh, you know, dual polarized antennas. And so um, you, you, one sense you are getting from here is that, you know, silicon ICs are becoming the uh, bread and butter of all millimeter wave communication, either for, um, you know, either for commercial applications, satellite applications, or even for defense applications. So that being said, let me just say, what are we doing in the space? That do we, uh, what we're gonna talk about is how do I take these frequencies one step further, about 100 gigahertz. So this is what we do in our lab at Princeton. You know, this is some of our past work. One of the areas that we work on are millimeter wave terahertz. 
The other area that we work on are sort of uh, more biomolecular systems, uh, health sensing, diagnostics, things of that nature. Uh, for both in vivo, in vitro, you can see a pill-based diagnostics, things of that nature. I'm not going to talk anything about that today. I'm not going to talk anything about our millimeter wave work also, but focus slowly about frequencies above 100 gigahertz. The techniques are very different, and so you know uh, it's hard to cover everything in one talk. Um, this is my lab. Well, this was my lab, you know, a few years ago, three, four years ago. And uh, so you can see that we are located in the eastern part of the United States, in New Jersey. Um, and uh, the lab is very multidisciplinary, um, very multicultural, as you can see. Um, very happy, uh, as you can see, everyone's happy. So, you know, we're all happy. Um, but, you know, if you are in the East Coast, please do uh, let me know. I'll be happy to host you when you are, uh, when you are here. So if I look at the frequencies above 100 gigahertz, you know, one thing you can notice is that last decade was an inflection point. Um, and so we, we were invited to write this paper with some of co-authors in Nature Electronics um, in the first year about what is the state of terahertz uh, technology evolution, either in chip scale system or in the photonic systems. And we took a closer look at this. So the terahertz has often been called as a terahertz gap. Why? Because terahertz sits between radio frequencies on one end and optical frequencies on the other end. And it seems that, you know, you have a lot of technology in the radio frequency, you have a lot of technology in the optical frequencies, but there's nothing in the middle, which is the terahertz gap. And so this was a state in 2007. You can see that the power falls drastically with frequency. And so the idea was it's very hard to generate power at the terahertz frequencies. And then by terahertz, I'm, I'm loosely defining at frequencies above 100 gigahertz here. Um, and though uh, there could be some you know, uh, confusions about that. Um, one thing you can notice is that red dot here, this was the first couple of works in 2008 in silicon generating power above 300 gigahertz, but this was nanowatts of power. Okay, So this was 2007, terahertz gap existed. This is 2018, you know, three years ago. Um, you see the gap is getting filled up. All of the technologies have improved. Uh, MMICs have now been better from 2008 to 2018. Resonant tunneling diodes are doing better. Uh, photo mixes are doing better. But what is remarkable is that silicon from this tiny dot on the bottom has moved up to here. Um, and this is log scale, right? <laughs> if you're talking about like 50, 60 dB here, uh, it's not 50, 60 times, it's a million times. The question is what happened in the last decade that allows us to generate now a million times more power than we could do in 2007? It's not that because transistor technology has dramatically changed. It's not, you know, silicon ICs are somehow better. It's we have realized, the communities in general has realized how to make best of the technology you are given. So power combination, uh, you know, antennas integration, power combining of chip, power combining quasi-optically, uh, things of that nature has allowed us um, to generate power in the milliwatt range. So now you can generate milliwatt power at one terahertz, at sort of half a terahertz in silicon, um, and that's a good number. Once you are able to generate milliwatt power, you can do interesting things. So that being said, uh, we have already done that. Uh, so what's the future? What's the next decade looks like? Well, if you think about what are these systems? Need? So think about a car. This is what you're seeing here is the LiDAR image from a car. Um, a car, which is a self-driving car, understands the environment not just by using one frequency. It uses optical frequencies, which is LiDAR. It uses optical, it also uses millimeter wave frequencies for us. Why? Because millimeter waves can penetrate through fog, can penetrate through cloudy environment that optical frequencies cannot. So it's useful to collect information across multiple portions of the spectrum and do sensor fusion to understand your environment in a robust way. And so for terahertz to be practical, and this is, happens in cars all the time, so idea of sensor fusion across spectrum, hyperspectral imaging, so to speak, is, is sort of key to make these robots or self-driving cars aware of its environment. And so what we basically said that there's not really a terahertz gap in technology, there's a terahertz and application gap. And if you need to fill that terahertz and application gap, you need to think about beyond just generating high power, beyond just generating higher efficiency imaging. 
What we need to do is adaptive and smart systems, systems that can program itself, collect information across multiple portions of the electromagnetic field. So if I do that and take it to an extreme, um, what would that system look like? So think about that. Right? So you have a terahertz sensor, you have a terahertz source, kind of a you know, sensory radar kind of a system. What are the three properties of electromagnetic fields uh, that you would like to program, right? So it'd like to adapt itself. So there's only three properties. One is for any distribution of electromagnetic fields, um, there is a field distribution like beam forming. So if you could change the direction of the beam, you're changing the field distribution, that's one. Number two is polarization. And number three is spectrum. So if you could manipulate your sources and sensors across all these pro uh, properties of electromagnetic field, you're getting close to the universal terahertz interface. So the question is, this is where we want to go. How do we go there? Right now, the approach is not that. Right now, the approach is generate maximum power at a given frequency. And what we are saying is, forget that uh, idea. Now, try, you know, try to have a system interface, either for a sensor or a source, that can program itself operations, for say, from 100 gigahertz to 500 gigahertz, program its polarization, and also program the spectrum of its operation. Now, that's hard. Generating power itself is hard. How do you program it? Why is it hard? It's hard because of a particular metric called Fmax. If it's a silicon, if it's any transistors, the Fmax basically tells you what is the maximum frequency of an amplifier you can build, or a maximum frequency of an oscillator you can build. Right? So that's fundamental to any receiver system. And if you think about the kind of Fmaxes we have with different technologies that you see on the right hand side, the, the purple dots are indium phosphide. And you see that enough phosphorus are above one terahertz. Okay, what is silicon? Silicon CMOS is sort of in the 200, 300 gigahertz range. HBTs are doing better, getting close to 500 gigahertz range, but silicon CMOS is not very good, right? So how the question is, if I give you enough phosphide, which is one terahertz, and if I give you a silicon uh, transistors, which is you know 300 gigahertz, it's heaven and hell difference, right? In terms of F max, factor of three. Factor of three is huge in these frequencies. So how should we think about approaching designing these systems in silicon? And why do you want to do a silicon? Low cost, high integration, smart adaptive system. That's why. But you cannot follow the same design methodology that works at RF, where your transistors are powerful. At terahertz, your transistors are weak, especially weak compared to 3.5. So your transistors are very weak compared to 3.5. Right, so the approach cannot be just you know just make an amplifier connect with something else and then and just like you know scaling up classical transceiver design. Approach has to be something different. And so the approach is, well, what's the, how do you, how do I fight this battle? The battle is because silicon has not just one device, you're not comparing device to device. Silicon has billions of devices, right? So how do question is how do I harness this collective power of many many silicon devices to be able to create a system that is powerful? Make sense? So we will see this idea of distributed approach. Distributed approach in terahertz sensing, distributed approach in terahertz power generation, distributed approach for programmability in both of sensors and sources. In long story short, you know, this would be a classical way of doing it, which is if you want to generate power, have some source, amplify it, do some harmonic generation, filter it, mix it up, do some matching network, put an antenna. This would be what we call the classical partition approach. You design each block at a time and you connect them together uh, and you, you get the system. What is the system doing? It is basically you know, getting information, up converting into terahertz and radio grounding field. So this is a classical architecture either for terahertz or radio frequency. What we are saying is that there could be other approaches towards that. What is the end, of, end goal of the system? The end goal of the system is to get information, which is digital bits, into electromagnetic fields for a transmitter or incident electromagnetic fields to information. And it does not have to go through these classical circuit blocks all the time. It is an, a suboptimal approach at these high frequencies. We have to find out other ways of connecting information to field and field to information without going to individually suboptimally uh, made blocks. 
<laughs> so you have to inventive all this, right? So you know, one example that uh, is helpful to think about uh, from a cricketing uh, parlance is uh, tennis is like T20 cricket, right? I mean, it's essentially if uh, if if you are you know stuck with uh, more traditional batting practices in Test cricket. Um, like the classical RF transceiver design, you're not going to be very good at P20. So you have to be inventive. Um, and so you got to find out newer ways of thinking about things that you couldn't do before, right? So I'll try to give you some ideas on what those approaches might be. So what is so unique about Terrace is the following. And this is where we, I want to emphasize it here. These frequencies is the only frequency where your chip size becomes comparable to the wavelength. Now, why do I say that? Think about 100 gigahertz. You know, the wavelength is 3 millimeters. The chip size is 3 millimeters, approximately. Think about 300 gigahertz. The wavelength is 1 millimeter. The chip size is a couple of millimeters. So 100 to 300, 500 gigahertz is the only frequency range where your chip size becomes comparable to the wavelength. <laughs> At radio frequencies, your wavelength is much larger than your chip. At optical frequencies, your wavelength is much smaller than your chip. So when the chip size becomes comparable to the wavelength, it enters a new electromagnetic regime by Maxwell's law. It's an, it enters a new radiative and scattering regime that it does not exist in any other frequency. So it's unique in that sense. So how do we leverage that? The idea is the following. Now think about what we wanted to do. We wanted to create programmable terahertz sensors, programmable terahertz source, that can either synthesize electromagnetic fields or receive electromagnetic fields, right? So imagine you want to synthesize some field distribution, E, X, Y, Z. That field distribution, by definition, or by, I guess, by laws of physics, is related to the oscillating radiating current surface on the chip, right? Radiating surfaces radiate you know, electromagnetic fields. So if I know the current surfaces, I know the field. In other words, if I know the field, can I know the current surface, which is JXY, that current surface might look very different from classical antenna current surfaces, right? So if I think about the inverse design approach, what I, we can do is calculate the current surface and then realize the current surface with active devices without being limited by the choice of antennas that we typically think about, which is patch, dipole, things of that nature. Right? And you will see that once we do that, newer architectures emerge where it does not look like a power source connected to an antenna. The antenna, the power source, the transistors are all part of one holistic system. Okay, and hopefully I'll give you some examples of that. So let me give you some examples of programmable terahertz sensors and you know how to think about that in, in one way. So we have done some work. These are, I would say, classical terahertz sensors, right? So you know, on the left hand side, this was um, work that we did at 300 gigahertz. It's a terahertz camera. And you can see this is a silicon chip. Um, is the antennas on chip directly? You can see how small the antennas are uh, because it's such high frequency. So the antennas are integrated on chip. The detectors are integrated on chip. So it's a, essentially a fully integrated terahertz camera. 16 pixel. Okay, so we take this chip, put it on a package uh, on a piece of plastic, and now we can do silicon terahertz imaging. So there's a toy. Uh, we, you know, we bought a bullet and a knife. Uh, because in the US, you can go to a Walmart and buy some bullet and a knife. Um, and we um, put the bullet here, and then we uh, use another CMOS sources. And you can see that even when it is covered, you can see the bullet and the knife inside. Right. So this was one of the earliest all silicon terahertz imaging setup. This was 300 gigahertz. We did some newer work at 3,000 gigahertz, 3 to 3.5 terahertz. Well, there's no electronic source at that frequency. so we. Uh, collaborated with, an, uh, with, uh, with a colleague of mine. Um, we use a terahertz quantum cascade laser, basically an optical source. And you know you can um, make systems that work at these frequencies as well. But these are still classical systems. It's an antenna connected to a detector. Let me show you an example which is very non-classical, which is the idea of how do I create these you know, active electromagnetic surfaces that we talked about. So this is one example. So we were interested in uh, spectroscopy. Um, there's a lot of interesting applications in the frequency. And what we have to do at the receiver side is the following. Your incident field has spectrum information. That spectrum information can go from gigahertz to terahertz. So if I wanted to know what the spectrum information is, that will give you the idea of the molecule that you're looking at. And you have to basically capture the field 
that's from gigahertz to terahertz, and then analyze the spectrum of it, right? So you basically build a spectrum analyzer after that. So you have an antenna um, that captures these high frequencies from gigahertz wideband high frequencies, and that's why the lock building spiral antenna. Uh, you connect it with the mixer, and then you down convert it, right? Now here's the challenge. If you're looking at say 100 gigahertz to 1000 gigahertz spectrum, you have to generate these frequencies for the mixer from 100 gigahertz to 1000 gigahertz. So your frequency of analysis is limited by the frequency range that your sources would cover. So if you wanted to make something as a spectroscopy on chip, this is the bottleneck. There's no source in the world that you can cover from you know, 100 gigahertz to 1000 gigahertz on chip. This is not going to work out, right? So this whole source is not going to work out. So we started thinking about this is also a very classical approach. This is what the classical approach would be. You have an antenna, you connect with a mixer, you connect with the source, partition circuit approach. What's the new opportunity? The opportunity is that the antenna is on chip. So are there other ways of extracting the spectrum information from the antenna rather than that just down converting? And so the idea was, Again, this idea, which is you know distributed, and the idea was the following: when the spec incident field hits the antenna, it excites a current distribution on the surface of the antenna. At the 100 gigahertz, it looks different. At 500 gigahertz, it looks different. At 1000 gigahertz, it looks different. And by Maxwell's law, these are unique. So the idea was, if I could sense real time the terahertz current distribution impressed on the antenna surface, then maybe I can back calculate what is a spectrum that actually created that current distribution? Make sense? If I could do that, then the entire spectroscope system is an antenna with near field detectors. There's no mixer, there's no LR source, there's no non-conversion, there's nothing, right? The entire spectroscope boils down to an antenna uh, with near field detectors. And then you can cover a massive range. Um, and so we showed that, that if you have an antenna and you have multiple detectors underneath the antenna, that can measure the current distribution in real time, you can use that sensor output to predict the spectrum. How does it look like? So imagine that the sensor outputs are here, which is the green sensor output. The red E is basically an unknown spectrum. These are two vectors that is related by some matrix. That matrix, obviously you can understand that is a, is a function of the structure of the antenna and the boundary conditions. So here, what we've known is this matrix. It's a one-time calibration. The sensor output, you're measuring it. The red is the unknown. So you basically converted the you know, spectroscopy problem, which is a very complex problem, to a linear estimation problem. You have the left-hand side known, you have the right side unknown, and you have the matrix known. So you basically have to do inversion. You can't really do inversion. You have to apply some algorithms like minimum least square, but you have to apply regularization for noise not to blow up. But apart from the signal processing apart, this is how it looks like, right? So you have one chip, you know, two millimeter by two and a half millimeter, with the integrated antenna, and the black dots here represent the 84 detectors that we connected under it. So one antenna not connected with one detector, like a classical approach, one antenna connected with 84 detectors distributed at sub wavelength scales. Those 84 detectors tells you the information of the current distribution on the surface of the antenna. We use that information to predict the spectrum itself. So what you get out of the chip is basically 84 low frequency outputs. From those low frequency outputs, we predict what the spectrum looks like. Now, these 84 detectors are connected directly to the antenna. So these are not high impedance detectors. The entire incident power is distributed on the surface and then distributed, absorbed on the 84 detectors. So instead of a classical antenna where all the power goes to the central port, as you can see, there is no detector at the center at all. So this antenna is not even used like a classical antenna. There is no, no receiver at the center port where the antenna typically there is. And so the entire structure basically absorbs the power, distributes on the detectors, and from those distributed information, we calculate the spectrum. So just we want to give you so you know some examples. You know, these are some examples on the right hand side. You know, we cover from 40 gigahertz to 990 gigahertz with the spectrum. But just imagine the range of 40 gigahertz to 990 gigahertz. 
apart from the complexity of the measurements, is really an amazing you know, uh, range of frequencies that you're covering here. So for example, when we excite at 66 gigahertz on the antenna on the chip, we get the 84 sensor outputs. And from that output, you're predicting what that spectrum looks like. And you can see that a estimated is directly on the incident. When I do this, when we do the same frequencies at say 918 gigahertz, which reach much higher frequencies, you can see that the matching is less accurate, but it's still good. And you see some you know, spectral noise estimation coming out. And it's not just single frequency. You can do multiple frequencies. Say we're doing it from 50 and 60 gigahertz. We have done multiple frequencies from 310 to 320 gigahertz. And the uh, predicted and the incident are very, very good. It's not as good as coherent, right? Because it's incoherent. But there's no coherent, uh, incoherent. In, there's, no, there's no system on chip. Uh, ever, I mean, in any pro process that has been able to do 40 gigahertz, 990 gigahertz without a source, right? And so the idea of this came not from considering the antenna with a better detector. It was how do I look at this antenna, not just something that converts some field to another field, but as an information source itself. Is there new opportunities that we can do from an antenna circuit co-design that opens up newer ways of getting incident information. So with that, you know, we started thinking about, um, can we do something interesting on this, right? So this was a nature communication paper that came out la last year, which was, we converted this idea into universality. So the idea was the following. Now we can detect power or current surface at sub-wavelength scales with sub-wavelength detectors. So then the question was, then can I manipulate it? Why do I need to manipulate it? Now think about it, what did we want to do? We wanted to create a universal terahertz sensor, which is programmable to frequency, polarization, angle of incidence, to be able to be, you know, get information across all of these three properties. Why are traditional antennas or traditional sensors not programmable across frequency? Well, because your interface is resonant at certain modes. So the question is, if I could detect those modes with sub wavelength detectors, can I then manipulate those modes? Um, and so the idea was, in addition to the detector, we add a little bit of uh, boundary conditions variability on each of the detectors. So each of these detectors has five states. We have 16 detectors, so you can see a lot of combination of states. And the idea was the following. So imagine I wanted to detect something at 300 gigahertz from broadside. All I have to do is program the right digital states that creates the optimal mode configuration on the surface. And if I want to now bend the beam at a different angle, all I do is change the programming of this electromagnetic surface. If I could do it across angle of incidence, I should be able to do across frequency. So if I had to do a 990 gigahertz, all I have to do is reprogram the electromagnetic surface by these distributed um, you know, digital sensors and that would hopefully create the optimal um, surface current for generation. Make sense? And so, you know, there's a lot of details here. I'm going to avoid that. But, um, you know, this is how the antenna chips looks like. Again, a lock periodic antenna. Now we have 16 detectors with these square dots. And each of the 16 detectors has five states. So there's five to the power of 16 or 150 billion states. So that's the number of electromagnetic states you can have. Um, they're not unique in many, many ways, but the whole point is that now, if you know the spectrum and angle of incidence and polarization, can I find the optimal state from this huge 152 billion state and find it for the, which is the optimal for the given incident field. So if I know that my spectrum is coming at say 100 gigahertz, can I just find it at the right uh, digital states? If I know what my angle of incidence, can I just do it? And if I could do it, you know, you're basically creating a sensor that is programmable across all properties of the incident field. So let me show you a simulation result that might help you to understand this a little better. So, you know, these um, is the antenna surface. Um, what I show here are the position of the sensors, right? So there's 16 sensors here. Um, the colors represent the digital states. The size represents how much local power is being absorbed. So if I have this digital state, it turns out that it's, it's, it's got a very nice radiation pattern or reception pattern to the sensor at 300 gigahertz, the blue one. If I operate the same sensor at 750 gigahertz, it's not very good. 
What if I just want to now change the digital states of the sensors, change the boundary conditions to make it operate at 750 gigahertz? So this is the you know this is the final state on the right hand side, and you can see that the radiation pattern at 750 gigahertz is now very good. The radiation pattern at 350 300 gigahertz is now very bad. And the, what we have done here is that the colors of the last two surfaces have changed, as you can see. The circular you know, sizes have changed. All you have done is, is sort of program the state to make it more optimal at 750 uh, when you go from 300 to 750. So you can see that this distributed structure, you can basically manipulating these current distributions and the sensory interface to change the properties of the radiation patterns uh, with respect to frequency. In this example, if you can do it frequency, you can do polarization and angle of incidence. Again, the details are in the Nature Comp paper, but you know we have measured from 260 gigahertz to 900 gigahertz, and we've got something between you know sometimes 3x to 10x enhancement um, in sensitivity uh, across the frequency range. Um, and we have gone that against not just frequency, but also polarization, also angle of incidence. So you can imagine you have a sensor that you can program on the fly to collect information across multiple angles and polarization to have a much more richer understanding um, of what your environment looks like. Right? But none of these ideas came from the classical idea of an antenna connected to a detector uh, because the range of you know, tunability in those systems is much, much lower. Through this distributed approach, you are creating very versatile systems. So we can do the same thing with terahertz sources and metasurfaces, and I want to um, end in you know, the last 10 minutes with that. Um, and so the idea here was uh, the following, which was, what if I try to do the opposite? I wanted to create a current surface. And so the question that we asked was, what is the optimal current surface for um, you know, nice radiation coming out of silicon dye? And the details are in the papers here, but the idea was, if I have a silicon chip with the mode, I can calculate the modes. If I can calculate the modes, I can calculate the current surface that minimizes the surface wave modes and maximizes radiated modes. If I could do that, it's an electromagnetic calculation, it turns out that one mode, not the only one, but one of them, looks like this. It looks like traveling wave current distribution. It's like circular loops, arrays of circular loops, as you can see. Each of the loops is not a loop antenna. It's a traveling wave loop. Okay. Now, antennas do not, typical antennas do not sustain traveling wave loops like that. So the question is, if I wanted to realize this current distribution, what would I do? What kind of antenna would you use? Um, and, and the whole point of this is like you're not going to use antennas, but you're going to synthesize the surface current with active circuits. Uh, so this is an example. Uh, as you can see, what we did was uh, we have two loops, and there's sort of transistors connected to them in a weird feedback fashion. Now, here's what happens. Um, if I just put like a one volt DC supply to this loop, as a result of this feedback, a traveling wave oscillation builds up at 150 gigahertz. Uh, these two loops now act as a differential transmission line. And because the currents are now out of phase, and because the currents are out of phase, it's not going to radiate anything at 150 gigahertz. But as the wave travels at 150 gigahertz, the transistors are nonlinear. So they're going to inject second harmonic frequencies into the loop itself. So a 0 and 180 at 150 would give you a 0 and 0 at 300. So as you can see that at the fundamental frequency of oscillation, the currents are out of phase. At the second harmonic, the currents on the loops are in phase, which essentially means that at first in the fundamental, the, the loops are behaving like a transmission line, like a differential transmission line. At the, at the second harmonic, it behaves like an antenna. So the same loops that behave like a resonator, oscillator at one frequency start behaving like an antenna at uh, other frequencies. And this is the kind of exact traveling wave loop that we wanted to create from our electromagnetic mode simulations, right? So we wanted to create traveling wave loops, and we are able to create traveling wave loops, not with an antenna like that, but with a multifunctional electromagnetic structure. Why is it multifunctional? Because it converts DC, DC supply, to filtered terahertz radiation directly in one structure. There's no external filter, there's no external antennas, there's nothing. It's completely integrated on chip. Um, from DC, it generates a traveling wave oscillation at 150. It cancels that radiation, so it's a filter. Second, it generates a sec uh, you know, second harmonic 300 gigahertz uh, traveling wave wave, also radiates that. 
uh, 300 gigas as well. So it converts all of these DC to you know, 300 gigas radiated waves, right? So the once you can do one, in silicon you can do many. So you have one of these structures, but now you have four by four. And so you can lock them with a central frequency synthesizer. You know, you can generate, uh, you know, 280 gigahertz with 10 milliwatt ERP. You can do electronic beam scanning and all kinds of things, right? So this was the first terahertz phase array in any technology uh, demonstrated. In a recent work, we've actually pushed these frequencies further, uh, which is the, uh, which we have done forehand, 16 gigahertz CMOS beam forming. This was an ISTCCC last year. And the idea was the following, right? If you, if any of you play uh, any musical instrument, you know metronomes. If you take multiple metronomes, and in typically they are a little bit off in frequency, off in phase, but if you put on a wooden platform that moves a little bit, they do nonlinear coupling between them. And if you wait for a certain time, they would all synchronize in frequency and phase. Why? Because that's the lowest energy of the system. And it turns out that you can do the equivalent of that mechanical coupling in electronic coupling. And we coupled in that way uh, multiple sort of oscillators uh, that allows a coherent radiation at 416 gigahertz with the record 25 milliwatt EIRP. Okay? And you can also do electronic beam scanning as well. As well. So if you look at this plot and below, this actually shows the coupling. If I turn the coupling off, you can see all of these oscillators are slightly different frequencies. So one is oscillating at 415, something is oscillating at 416, and this is radiated field measurement far field. So the antennas are also on chip. You can see the patch antennas as well. But when we turn uplink, all of this collapses into a nice single tone, the red one, which is oscillating in frequency and oscillating in phase. So that's become synchronous. So now we are able to generate really high power at 416 gigahertz with spatial field control. One of the other ones that we want to do program with, we want to do spatial field for control, but we also wanted to control spectrum, right, to be able to do hyperspectral imaging. So what we basically found out that if I could do one frequency, then I can add multiple frequency and kind of amplitude and phase to create arbitrary waveforms. So what we did was we had one chip with multiple harmonic generations, and by controlling the delays of these um, uh, you know, signals, you can synthesize pulses, you can synthesize uh, waveforms. This is basically an arbitrary waveform generation at a single chip that you can program to generate arbitrary spectral waves um, at different points in space. Uh, so you can use it for hyperspectral imaging or, and things of that nature. If you could do spectrum, we have done space. Now the question was near field. How do you do near field control? And so this was a paper that just came out as a cover article in Nature Electronics, December 2020. And this was a programmable terahertz metasurface with silicon chips. So you can see that we have four chips here, which are tiled together. It's like a Lego block. You can build larger surfaces with that. If I zoom in there, you can see that you know, these are the kind of elements. This is periodic because it's metasurface. And sort of weird flowery pot structure. And so the idea is the following. You can see that each of these structures has multiple small subwavelength inductors. And these blue um, structures are actually transistors. And what we do here is at 300 gigahertz, we can program the nature of scattering of each of these structures. So the idea of the metasurface is the following. It does not generate its own power. You have a far field wave. It hits the metasurface, and then it can create multiple beams on the transmission side or on the reflection side. So you hit an incident field, it can focus light in different directions. It's almost like a programmable lens, uh, but at terahertz frequencies. Um, and it can do holographic projections as well. So uh, this was actually the first you know, demonstration of such programmability at terahertz. You, know, you can see the measured results here. We can bend the beam, so it's a surface, Right? It's, it consumes almost zero DC power because it's passive. It just has digital programmability. So the wave comes, hits it, and you can bend it in different directions. You can focus it. You can create multiple beams and all kinds of things. Right, So you can see that you have beam forming ability at these frequencies, powerless beam forming. But you can also do projection. So what we did was we programmed the scattering surface to pro, you know, sort of project P and U. But these are not optical frequencies. 
is at 300 gigahertz uh, projection. You can't see it. You have to measure it to see it. Um, and so you have to find out the optimal scattering conditions to be able to do that. And this is actually the measured results here. You can see this is P, and, well, no, P is sort of P, and U. But this is created at 300 gigahertz at five millimeter distance, right? So th think about the complexity of the field configuration that writes a P and U uh, at 300, just showing that you can have amplitude and field control uh, and phase control at the surfaces. So now this is like an ultimate holographic projector. You can do far field, you can do near field, you can do near field imaging and all kinds of things. So that again, the idea of universality, right? So instead of making something just working for one thing, we're making something that works for all things. You can do other things as well. Um, I'll not go into details about this one. So this is the idea of using spectrum as security. Uh, this was ICCC last year. Uh, the Nature Electronic paper is going to come out soon as well. Um, and the idea was the following. Okay, I'm not sure how it's done, but just give you the following idea. If I had a phase delay, okay, and I wanted to create a link between Alice and Bob, and suppose I want to do a QPSK then eavesdropper at any of the side loads would also get a QPSK, right? Just low power. So it's not secure. Uh, what we did was the following. We have what we call a spatiotemporal array where Alice can send it to Bob with Q, still QPSK, high SNR, but eavesdropper at any of other locations would get garbled constellation. Uh, information would be lost. So unlike a phased array where constellation is preserved across space, where signal, uh, where spectrum is preserved across space, here spectrum is garbled across space. So what you would see here is garbled spectrum like that, like what Eves is seeing. It's not QPSK, but Bob is going to see QPSK. So it's creating sort of physically secure links. Um, you know, these are again chips, uh, antennas, and so on and so forth. So I'm not showing details, but here is some measurement results. And you can see that for a phased array, the constellation, the way to think about it is this constellation with angles. So it's like four pipes, right? Four pipes going out because it's QPSK with angle. Um, but for the spatial temporal model array, you can see that it's completely garbled other than Bob. So Bob, where you want to communicate, would receive the right spec constellation. Everything else will be coupled. So this is again spectrum to space mapping being used for um, security. This is a newer work. Um, it came out of ICC this year, which is spectrum to space mapping for localization. Uh, and, and the idea is the following. Again, I will not go into details. It's the idea that can I create a terahertz prism? Which is what does a prism do? It casts lights at different directions. So this casts terahertz lights at different directions. So this is a source. It maps different, you know, it sends out different spectrum at different points. And the idea is, imagine a warehouse, we have robots going. Uh, a robot just measuring the local spectrum can know where the robot is. It's basically a local GPS, right? And so by moving across in space, if you have the right spectrum from a source, um, by just measuring the local spectrum, the robot can localize itself. And so this was we were doing at 362, 420 gigahertz. How do you create a spectrum? That how do you create radiations that go at different angles with respect to spectrum? We use leaky wave antennas, but also directly integrated on chip with 364 and 20 gigahertz transceivers, transceivers, fully integrated transceivers. So you can see that all of these ideas of programmability with respect to spatial field configuration, um, you know, spectrum with respect to space manifests itself in different applications. It could be for localization, it could be for physical layer security, it could be for imaging. But the fundamental idea is how do I manipulate electromagnetic field distribution in space? And it can lead to different kinds of innovations as a result of that. So I would say that, you know, if you if you want to have one takeaway message from this, I think it's if you are interested in this field above 100 gigahertz, really need to think about architecture and design, right? The idea that you have to start with these local blocks and you optimize this and connect them together, if not necessarily true. There's a lot of, I would say, innovation that can be leveraged with sort of signal processing, electromagnetic circuits, um, and co-design that we have not explored at all in the space. And we have in showed some examples uh, of, of, of some of these uh, you know, approaches here. Um, I will end the talk by you know, obviously paying homage to where it all began. And millimeters wave didn't begin anywhere else, but in India, right? Um, this is Jesse Bose. And if you haven't had a chance to 
look some of the innovations he had done in that space in the mid 1890s uh, you would uh, you would be amazed um, you, you can see that I mean the kind of innovations he he made uh, just taking regular books this is actually a yellow page uh, train catalog and he cut tiny slits on them to make polarizers uh, and things of that nature it is just it, the creativity is just amazing so I would definitely you know urge you to think about it um, it's and uh, it's all began, you know, in in India, and so you know, it's it's remarkable that he did many of these experiments back at, with 60 gigahertz back back in the day. Um, I like one um, quote that I really like, and, and I've tried to tell it to my students. Um, you know, creativity and thinking out of the box is 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 necessary for innovations, right? And and one quote that I really like is, is the following, which is. It says reasonable people, this is George Bernard Shaw, he says reasonable people adapt themselves to the world. Unreasonable people attempt to adapt the world to the, um, themselves. All progress therefore depends on unreasonable people. So be unreasonable, be creative, think outside the box and don't feel, you know, fear, fear failure. Um, I tried to pick some pictures um, from my days in Kharagpur. Um, and at that door is we didn't have smartphones, right? So we hardly had cell phones. Um, you know, my first couple of years, I had to stand in the, it was such a different time, uh, you know, STD boots to make phone calls back, even into Calcutta, from Kharagpur to Calcutta. Um, but now, you know, things are different. These are a couple of pictures I were able to find. Um, and this was some of my friends. We are still very, very good friends. This is actually the ECE department. And, and then these are some of um, my batchmates. Chintan is right now in Apple. Um, Oracle is right now in Microsoft, Hyderabad. Um, I don't know when Nicole is actually. So, um, so you know, these are very fun memories at the time. Um, and it all began in, in, in the hallways of well, hallways of Kirkport. So with that, I will acknowledge my Spencer, uh, sponsors and end the talk and happy to uh, have any questions uh, as well. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Singh Gupta, for this very informative talk. Uh, and in, the, in this limited uh, session duration, you provided very good brief uh, review of Terahertz uh, and uh, technology and its application. So thank you so much for uh, accepting our request. Also, I would like to uh, mention that uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Tarun Kanti Bhattacharya. He is sure. uh, from EC Department of Kharagpur, IIT Kharagpur. So I would like to, I would request uh, Professor Bhattacharya uh, if you can uh, comment. Yeah. You know, there is uh, always a delightful feeling when students long back showing after seeing his picture in the student days, now where he is. And the kind of work what he is doing at the moment is really unexpected. So I would say that really unconventional thinking or unreasonable thinking may go to that level. But, uh, you know, out of box thinking, I always, when I discuss with Kaushik during his days in this, I, I believe in uh, unconventional way of looking into the matters. So that finally you will arrive into something which will uh, really will be a breakthrough. That is the breakthrough. The new innovation will come in that way. I also appreciate uh, Kaushik for uh, naming Sir Jagodish Bosch. Uh, who started the millimeter wave uh, research right in uh, science college long back in 18. And uh, but I have a uh, uh, couple of questions to Kaushik that uh, it is a magic lecture. So undoubtedly it's a heartbreaking research at the moment you are doing. And I also appreciate that you are using basically the same silicon platform and purely in a different way you try to use that silicon platform in developing this 400 gigahertz or above 100 gigahertz source and um, and i find the metal lines are on the top of that and i i just question that is there any node limitations to implement this work or you can try with any node 
for this uh, work? Yeah, that's a good question, right? So uh, with respect to node, uh, I would say the following. There is one node limitation, but it is, um, but it doesn't mean that you have to pick one process. So if you look at, you know, how frequency or F max has scaled uh, with nodes, you know, if you go from 180 nanometer to 65 nanometer, you know, your F max has gone up, right? To around 300 gigahertz. But beyond 65, it hasn't gone up that much. Yeah. So um, if, if you want to, you know, scale frequencies above 100 years, I think, you know, anything below 65, you know, 65 nanometer is good. Uh, you know, 40, 45, 28 nanometer is great. Um, um, but as long as you have some access to 65 uh, nanometer and, and thereby it's fine. 180 nanometer is probably too low a node to, uh, to be able to. Uh, frequencies, uh, yeah, of that nature. But again, you know, um, if you think about the first 24 gigahertz space arrays that we uh, that, that happened in back in the mid 2000s, they were done in 180 nanometer silicon germanium, not CMOS, but silicon germanium. Um, and so, you know, there are techniques that you can exploit, but um, you know, uh, but having 65 and below for CMOS is, is definitely helpful. And also, the metal lines on the top of that. Is it a floating structure or it is uh, actually embedded on, on, on the insulating dielectric layer? Yeah, yeah so this is the uh, meta surface you're talking about? Yeah, I am talking about. Yeah, so let me just show. Uh, let's see. Because I, I'm just looking at the field the coupling and right, the right, right, right. distributions in the. Correct. Um, can you see the screen? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. So if you. Um, so let's see. Okay, so if you see this structure, um, it, you know, this is embedded in the dielectric. This is actually the top layer of the CMOS process. And, and so typically a meta, it's like a C-shaped uh, split ring resonator. And that would just be a circle with a, with a hole, right? So what we are doing is the following. We have eight, uh, you break the loop and connect transistors, right? So the idea is that by you're emulating different scans, tiny loops, which are essentially local inductors within the sub-wavelength meta element, yeah. um, allow the transistors to operate as a switch because we are looking at 300 gigahertz. This is yeah. above F max. The transistor cannot operate as a switch, right? Yes. The on -off ratio of the transistors is, is, is a one at the point, right? So on is as good as off. Um, and so the, the way we make it work is we resonate the parasitic capacitance with this smaller loop. Mm -hmm. And so we have eight transistors and eight loops. Now, this is one element. The entire structure has 576 elements like that. And that allows to create the electromagnetic field projections for, uh, you know, beam forming and holographic projection, because you may need, you know, many of them to be able to do that. But this is completely, again, realized with silicon. The only is we need some professional packaging because yeah. it has to be, you know, the incident field is transmitted, so it has to be incident from the back side, connected to the front side. So we have like quads plating on the top and the bottom that you can see on this sort of square. This square yeah. basically houses a, um, you know, sort of quads play. So, uh, just that the question comes to me in my what is the yield? Means uh, you get the dye and then you tested it out, uh, and uh, what is the yield? How many? Pretty good, right? Yeah, um, it's, it's not bad at all, right? Because, um, you know, the, these are based on, you know, sort of electromagnetic simulations that we. We've taken the parasitic signal account and the transistor characteristics into account. So the yield is pretty reasonable. When I mean, we basically uh, did the measurement that we see is basically the first chip. Um, and um, yeah, but those are four chips connected together, right? So the idea was we can take this as you know, small pieces and blocks and make it larger for each with that. So should you expect a commercial exploitation of your work in future? Yeah, so there's a lot of, you know, this is 300 gigahertz. Again, this is a little further in frequencies, but there's a lot of interest happening in the idea of reflective intelligent surfaces, RIS, which is the idea that, you know, think about millimeter wave communication. This is a directional communication, so it easily gets blocked. So if someone gets into the way, your communication link disappears. So the idea is that can we have like, you know, sort of wallpaper-like surfaces, mm -hmm. which are almost like programmable mirrors, Mm -hmm. 
And so imagine you have a node in your room that's connected to your whatever cell phone, uh, but someone walks in and then the node gets blocked. And so the beam, get, beam gets diverted into a wall yeah. that has a surface that can you know create a link back, right? Um, and so these are not repeaters. These are not, they don't need to amplify, but just need to create the right reflection. Uh, but needs to be programmable reflection. It doesn't, it yeah. cannot be a static um, And so that, there, there has been sort of, you know, even in the um, communication societies, people are looking into that aspect of it. Because now if we have that, your network architecture looks very different because now you have these, you know, passive nodes yeah. uh, that you can paste anywhere, run by a battery, uh, allows you to create sort of more complex network configurations. So is there any low-hanging fruits in front of you? In, in, in There's time? no low-hanging. All the low-hanging has been taken. The tree is now empty. <laughs> You have to immediately jump into it, and, and uh, I mean, there are, I think uh, I think there are right. So I think um, uh, this, I mean we we push the boundaries here at Terra, but even in millimeter waves, I haven't seen that much of paper um, that has done. It's a, the way to create these nodes at millimeter waves is through like pin diamonds, right? So you know these are things that. Uh, does not need a silicon fabrication, um, but you know, with collaborations with say networking experts or communication experts, you, you can create, you know, you can print the structures, antenna structures, uh, easily. You know, pin dyes are commercially available at this frequency, so you can, you know, it's not hard to do these things at 24 gigahertz, for example, and it's actually useful uh, to do this thing at 24. Um, and you already have equipment at, at, at least at that frequencies, right? So, it, you know, these things can, you know, it's completely doable. Thank you, Koshik, and hope we'll be in touch. Absolutely, yeah. yeah I yeah, wish absolutely. you all the best, yeah. Thank you for attending. Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, I have a few questions. So, I'll uh, read for everyone. So, one of them is uh, which type of detectors used at low periodic antennas for terahertz frequency? Oh, we use uh, silicon. This is silicon chips, right? These are sort of silicon germanium transistors. Uh, rectifiers so these are hbd heterojunction bipolar transistors that we used uh, that comes with the chips itself okay okay so one more question is uh, is it uh, possible to design quantum antennas for uh, 6g 7g 8g so what is a quantum antenna uh, yeah that, maybe, maybe the person can ask the question themselves right i mean can, yeah yeah yeah. Uh, can you uh, please unmute yourself, Ganga Sagar Verma, if you are here? Uh, okay. okay. I think he uh, left the um, meeting. So, okay. okay. Uh, we'll go to the next question. Uh, is it fine with you, right? You have time? Yeah, 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 go ahead. yeah sure. Yeah. yeah. So, in the terahertz spectroscopy, Using antenna, what can be the resolution of the spectrum? Yeah, that's um, a good question. Um, yeah. The resolution is not as good as a coherent system, right? Because we don't have a timing source. Um, in here, we um, we could detect with some, you know, uh, clever signal processing something in the range of tens, ten megahertz and tens of megahertz. Um, but that's sort of limited by the detector noise um, in many cases. Uh, the resolution, but again, it depends on the frequency of interest. At one terahertz, it's lower. At you know, hundred gigahertz, it's better. But on average, it's all the order of tens of megahertz. Okay. So one more question: that uh, please explain a bit about linear estimator regarding how exactly both amplitude and phase information are estimated. Yeah, uh, there's no phase information. There's only amplitude information. Um, so you, all you have is your sensor output, which is a square law detector. So essentially, you've lost the phase because you know it's square law. Um, so, uh, but in many cases, you don't need phase information for terahertz spectroscopy. You know, amplitude of the spectrum is good enough. Um, so in, in the one that I showed, it is just amplitude information, no phase. You don't have a timing source on the on those chips. So how do you get phase? There's a way of getting phase, um, but you have to measure at multiple. Uh, distances and, and do some other signal processing. You can change the non-linearity of the detector to move from square law to cubic law, and cubic law has phase information. So if you do all of these things, you can get phase information, but in general, it's just amplitude information. Okay. 
Okay, uh, one more question is, uh, which foundry uh, are you using at a terahertz? And is there any advantage of on-chip meta surface design over on package design? Yeah, uh, good question. So for for that meta surface, it was uh, TSMC um, uh, foundry uh, for CMOS. Uh, for we have used various foundries. We have used IBM, TSMC, and, and so on and so forth. For that particular work, you cannot do a package because it's a 300 gigahertz. So there is no uh, active devices that work, which is not on chip. At the, even an on chip device doesn't work at 300 gigahertz, right? So we had to do this, uh, you know, canceling resonance every transistors locally to be able to do that. You cannot do these things in, in package for sure. Um, at lower frequencies, uh, you can do metasurface with package. Even at millimeter waves, you can. But at 300 gigahertz, there's no other. Um, packaging is not going to work out. OK. By the way, the package on chip is hardly anything, right? It's basically, we have chips uh, that doesn't, we have chips that has everything inside, including the metasurface. The packaging essentially to rest the chip. Right, to have a quartz plate that holds the chip. It's like a plate to hold the chips. Otherwise, the chips will just fall by gravity. So that's the only thing that we use for packaging. OK, so one more last question. That What is the major challenges and limitation uh, that we face during chip design at terahertz and beyond uh, or beyond? Except the frequency. Yeah, I mean, there's many, many major challenges, right? One, you know, one is the fact that your transistors are not good. So it essentially means that you have to be careful with the design itself. The parasitics matter, the architecture matters. And it's essentially an end-to-end -end design system. The antenna has to be part of the design itself. So, you know, it's really a system where, um, again, you know, uh, you cannot separate these individual parts uh, out. Uh, once you put the antennas on chip, you don't have to design a 50 ohm antenna. Uh, it could be anything because all you have to do is uh, match with the receiver that you have, which doesn't have to be 50 ohm. Um, and so there are many opportunities to open up, but then also you have to think about the end point. Okay, so we have one more question, if you allow. Yeah. So, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, we'll take one last question. Uh, why was the log periodic antenna used in the system presented? Will any other antenna type will work? Yeah, great question. Actually, um, we, as, as rightly pointed out, we are not using a log periodic antenna in a classical log periodic antenna way, right? So the idea of a log periodic antenna is that if you look at the impedance at the center, it's almost constant with frequency because of the log periodic nature. But we don't have any detector at the center. We have detectors distributed on the surface. There is no theory at this point existing that allows a, such a you know antenna to a multiport matching, and so we don't know. Nobody knows what the optimal structure looks like. We use a log periodic antenna with some intuition, and the idea intuition is like different spokes will resonate at different frequencies and give you the you know sort of spectrum information better. But it is possible that some other structures are much better than this one. Um, and so, you know, that theory doesn't ex exist. We don't know what the optimal structure looks like. Uh, and so we picked up with some intuition and then focused on how to get the maximum out of it. But you're completely right. You know, we have no idea what the optimal structure looks like. Okay. Okay. So I hope uh, it answers all the questions. Uh, so a uh, few more questions are there. So I'll forward it to you. And also attendees can uh, contact you. Uh, uh, Dr. Singh Gupta directly also. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a pleasure presenting it. You know, yeah. um, you can find my email address uh, on the web page on the net. Um, and so, you know, uh, all I would say is thank you for your time. I know it's late in the evening there. You know, be safe. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenging time for many of you and uh, many of my family back in India. So, you know, stay yeah. safe, uh, stay focused, and, you know, be well. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, all attendees. Thank you for uh, joining us. So, yeah, we can conclude. Yeah. We'll conclude right. now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.